Good evening, brothers and sisters um, in the Lord Jesus Christ and young people. Hopefully what we're going to try and do as we come to the fourth um, study in our series on Saul's journey from adversary to advocates, we're going to see the next seven years of history unfold before us in the gospel in, in the story of Acts. And what we're going to climax in tonight is really the the last and final lesson that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to teach Saul of Tarsus. What we're going to see as we go through the story of tonight is we're going to really um, piece together the story of why Acts takes a bit of time before Christ unleashes Saul to conduct his um, ministry to the Gentiles. We're going to answer a couple of very key questions associated with that timing. And what we're going to show is we're going to show that the Lord Jesus Christ had one lesson that was going to to absolutely put the boot into Saul to finally catapult him into action to perform his public ministry of being Christ to the Gentiles. But it has been a couple of weeks um, since we did cover the last few studies, so very quickly let's recap on where we've come from. Well, we've watched Saul of Tarsus grow as from a young boy into an incredibly amazing um, teenager and um, young adult. A passionate man that grew to become a fanatic Pharisee who returned home to, to we think, take a wife and upon the death of his wife come back to Jerusalem to follow his rabbinical career. And what we saw is, is just that when he returned back to Jerusalem, it was an entirely different place than, than when he first uh, when he had left it before. Because now, now the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and the death of Jesus of Nazareth and his followers had completely transformed the city of Jerusalem. And in fact, all of Judea um, and, and the remaining parts of Galilee. And we saw him take umbrage at the teaching of, the, of, the Nazareth, the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth and his, and his followers. And we watched his source. Um, vehement hatred begin to grow against the sect of the Nazarenes or the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and we watched it it, it, as Saul made a complete havoc of the ecclesias in Jerusalem smashing through ecclesias particularly the vibrant bustling ecclesia of over 10,000 brothers and sisters in the city of Jerusalem the ecclesia of Jerusalem to reduce it to or nothing but the apostles remaining He went through there like a bowling ball, scattering them as they went. And as he stood on the fire to try and stamp it out, what Saul, unfortunately to him, didn't realize, was that he blew the ashes to create a wildfire as the believers scattered across, up through Samaria, up through Galilee, and into Asia Minor, preaching everywhere they went. And so we saw him gird up his loins and start chasing them as, as, they, as they continued to scatter and preach the word everywhere they went. And he chased them to Damascus. And we witnessed him come face to face with a dawning realization by the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9 that actually he wasn't in control. He would begun to understand that actually the apostles' doctrine and the miracles were of God. And when confronted by the risen Lord, we saw him fall on his face as Christ outlines to him his new role and confirmed Saul had never been in control at all, all the way through his life. But that Christ had been orchestrating and directing him to this point. And that now Christ had a very special mission for him to take the truth to the Gentiles. And as outlined by faithful Ananias, Saul and the preparation by Ananias, Saul escapes to Arabia to spend some time in the cave of his fathers to receive the detail of his instructions as his apostleship to the Gentiles. And there, and we're going to see this in our next class, he gets taught that he was going to bear Christ's name before all and suffer great things for his sake. And upon his return into Damascus, uh, back into Damascus, he storms into the synagogue and boldly proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We're going to pick up the story in Acts chapter 9 and verse 19. Because Saul comes storming back up through Jerusalem and and Judea, up through Samaria, back into into um, Damascus, and blows through the doors of the synagogues in Damascus. And straightway, says Acts chapter 19, verse 20, he preaches Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. 
You see, Saul's conversion, brothers and sisters, young people, took the Jewish world by a storm. Absolutely, they were gobsmacked and frightened and bewildered. You know, just, just stop and think about this for a minute. Just imagine that the mayor of Christchurch decided to take umbrage against the Christadelphians. So all four ecclesias in Christchurch got basically eradicated. Everyone escaped Rangiora. No, no, it's not quite like that. <laughs> everyone, everyone disappeared, okay? And the mayor of Christchurch decides to come and to knock on the home of Brother Glenn Davies in Kaipo because everyone was meeting there. How would you feel? You see, just imagine the shock. Just imagine the horror. Just imagine the pandemonium as Saul walks into the synagogue in Damascus. Just, we walked into the hall here. You just imagine people bolting for the door, climbing out windows. They could put chairs flipping everywhere as we try to escape from Saul. And yet when he opened his mouth, here in Damascus, brothers and sisters and young people, he opens and teaches that Jesus is the Son of God. Just imagine it. Christ the Messiah? The very thing the Jewish Sanhedrin had pinned against the Lord Jesus Christ himself and crucified him for? He was their greatest advocate, as far as the Sanhedrin were concerned, preaching the very thing they had murdered the Messiah for. And he was their champion, preaching and pronouncing that he was the son of God. You know, I don't know about you, but I would certainly think it was some new trick. Some ruse to just to, to lull us into a false sense of security before he came in and just ushered all of us off with a whole bunch of people. You know, they were, I guarantee, brothers and sisters, that they were actually a little bit scared of this. But the more he stayed there, and the more he talked about it, the more they began to believe him. And the stronger his arguments became. Look at verse 21 and verse 22. But, but all um, that heard him were amazed and said, Is not he this which destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And they came hither with that intent that he might bring them bound unto chief priests? But verse 22 is Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. The more he talked about it, the more they began to believe him, and the stronger those arguments became. And so therefore he began to confound them. It means to throw them into complete disorder or perplex. He began to make them question, this is the Jews themselves, what was the truth? Saul began to unpack all of the Jewish doctrines, the law of Moses and the prophets, and drove them to an obvious conclusion to show them everything that was pointing forward in the law and in the prophets to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Imagine. You know, just imagine the star pupil of Gamaliel providing his rabbinically reasoned watertight arguments coupled with earth-shattering logic so that no one could withstand him. Now, if they couldn't withstand Stephen, here comes Saul with all the knowledge of the law at his fingertips to convince them that the Lord Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Messiah. But it didn't take long, did it? After many days, it says, verse 23, that were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Do you know, we don't have time to, to look at all this, but when you piece together the story in Galatians chapter 1 and Acts, the Acts record, it, it, for a period of about three years, Saul spent dedicated time in Damascus. He spent time with the apostles, uh, sorry, with the disciples that were there to prove and to work with them, obviously supported by Ananias, to argue in the synagogues and to grow in confidence day by day. You want a proof of that, that it was three years? Galatians chapter 1 verse 18. Scratch in your margin against verse 23. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 18. Three years he spent in Damascus. But it wasn't going to be long really before the very things the Sanhedrin had plotted against Peter and John in Acts chapter 5. And the very thing they plotted against Stephen in Acts chapter 7. They then began to plot against Saul here in Acts chapter 9. 
And so began a series of plots against Saul's life. As he began to begin his new identity as Saul the believer. You know, the first of his, that plot against his life was here in Damascus. The second was in Jerusalem. And many, many, many more were going to follow. But with the believer's assistance, verse 24, he escapes. But their laying a wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down the wall in a basket. He, was escaped, he escaped down the wall in a food basket by night. You know, think about the Saul of Tarsus that wandered in blind in the middle of the night to the man who now leaves in a basket in the middle of the night. Totally and utterly not the man who wanted to go in the first place as the fanatic Pharisee with all authority of the Sanhedrin. And where did he go? Well, he, he let down a wall in a basket and came to Jerusalem. From Damascus he went back to Jerusalem. Let me just put this up here so that we can just get, a, get an idea of, of what's going on in the story. Because it, there was a reason why I believe Saul of Tarsus wanted to go back to Jerusalem. Because it would appear from the record that Saul wanted to try and immediately right the wrongs he had once performed and deal with the issues of the things that he had orchestrated in the murder of the Christians three years earlier. And he wanted to deal with those issues head on. I'll show you that in a second in, in, um, in Acts 22. But you see, it was all way too fresh and raw, still three years on for the believers, for the fragmented um, um, remnant who remained, who had lost their loved ones, their friends, their families and their lands, for Saul to actually become a valued member of their ecclesia. See, verse 26 says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he assuaged to join himself. In the Greek it really means to test or to attempt. Paul, I'm sorry, Saul knew it would be a hard graft. He never thought it was going to be easy, but he wanted to prove that he'd changed. But like those in Damascus, they thought it was a cunning trick to try and snare and catch and destroy them. And they were afraid, it says. You know, but they were all afraid of him. In the Greek, it means to be completely terrified. This is the man that had murdered their father, taken their mother, Ground their grandparents into the ground. They were completely and utterly terrified him. Only a few newly baptized disciples remained among, alongside the, the apostles. It wasn't going to work for Paul. He saw persecutions and, the, and his presence was way too fresh in everyone's mind. But thankfully, and what we're going to show you tonight, is that Christ had been working in the life of of another individual to help him. Christ had provided another faithful brother like he had in Ananias. He now provides uh, Ananias in Damascus. He now provides Barnabas in Jerusalem to guide and to care for Saul. And so Barnabas takes him, means to seize or to catch him. He, he forcefully took Saul aside. And so Barnabas takes him. You know, Barnabas is the rich man, the law-abiding and godly disciple of Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. The man who had given lands for the Jerusalem Ecclesia, for the, for the well-being of the saints. And he was held in high reputation by the apostles and the believers. This is the man that Christ had prepared, who took him and brought him under his wing. And brings him to the apostles. And it's Barnabas that wants to really tell the story about what's going on. You see, he brings him to Peter and to James. Put in your margin Galatians chapter 1 verse 18 and 19. This is the incident recorded in Galatians 1 verse 18 and 19. He only saw Peter and James, the only apostles on this time. And so now with Barnabas' testimony... The apostles learnt all about Saul in Damascus. 
You see, Barnabas says to, in verse 27, he brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him in Arabia and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so he probably stayed with Peter for about 15 days. Galatians chapter 1 verse 18. He was in Jerusalem for 15 days. But I want you to notice that Saul didn't keep a low profile on his way back into Jerusalem. No, even though he couldn't join himself to the disciples, he thought he'd take on his, the people of his own group, the Grecians. Look at what it says in, in verse 28. So he was with them, coming in and going out of Jerusalem. In verse 29 it says, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. His own countrymen. Saul decides, now that he's back in Jerusalem, he would find every opportunity to speak in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he takes his arguments to those of his own origins to, to, to try and show his own countrymen the truth, thinking that they might have a, a little bit more understanding as to his background, to accept his logic. But unfortunately he's mistaken, because they too try to kill him. But there's a difference for Saul on this occasion in Acts chapter 9. Because the difference is this. Instead in, of before in Damascus, him escaping over the wall in a food basket, Saul decides that this is a, an opportunity to stand his ground and to potentially die for the cause. I want to show you that in Acts chapter 22. He wanted to convert them, stand his ground and convert them, or die in the process. Acts 22 verse 17. We pick up the story as Paul recounts it in Acts 22. Because Christ had to intervene on this occasion. And pull Saul's head in. So in Acts 22 verse 17. And so, so he says, when, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, this is the Lord, make haste and get thee out of Jerusalem for, thy, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. So Christ turns to them and says, it's not going to work. They're not going to receive thy testimony. Saul, it's not going to happen, at least not from you. I've got a different work for you. But Paul decides to have it out. Saul decides to have it out with the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 19. And I, and I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beaten every synagogue, them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. I was responsible for their death. It was my fault. I'm not going to let this go. You know, Christ, Christ said to put, tweak his ears on this occasion, because look what he says. Verse 21. And he said unto me, depart. You know, that wasn't actually a suggestion. In the Greek, it's a very emphatic command. Get out, Saul. Get out. For I will send thee far hence to the Gentiles. You see, Christ had to pull his head in and say to him, you, you, you've been given a ministry. Do you fully understand it? Do you get it? This is not your fight. I'm in control. I've been in control all along, Saul. I've got something else in store for you. Get out. Your work's not here in Jerusalem with the Jews, but far hence with the Gentiles, that they might learn about the forgiveness of sins. Get out. You see, brothers and sisters, young people here in Jerusalem, Saul was stubbornly and zealously and naively trying to convert the Jews. With the passion and the intensity of a newly baptized brother in the truth. And Christ had to intervene and declare to him, and to remind, us, to remind Saul that he had another mission to perform unto the Gentiles. Do you think that's a really valuable lesson we can learn from that occasion, brothers and sisters and young people? Because, do you know, 
sometimes passion and sometimes a fervency for doing that which is right sometimes mean we stand all over each other as we try and help solve the issues of ecclesial life. Do you know, sometimes we may not be the best people to deal with a problem, to solve a challenge, or to overcome a situation. In fact, if we are too passionate, we might not be the right people. You see, because passion can blind us to actually trying to get the right outcomes. We may not, in fact, be the best person or best people for the job, even though we feel we may be, or we even think we might be. You know, we have to constantly be asking ourselves the question when we're working with others in the truth, are we the right people? Or is someone else better or more equipped or better tasked or might have a deeper appreciation or an understanding of that particular challenge or problem that might be far more effective to solve the problem. You know, sometimes I think we try and solve the problem, not help our brothers and sisters. There's a really careful distinction between that. We have to help. We, We need to do what's right for the truth. Don't get me wrong. But we have to appreciate that Christ is working in our lives. See, Christ was working with Saul on this occasion to get him to an appreciation that he had other things for him to do. We've got to try and be thinking like that. What is God doing in our lives? What is God doing with our brothers and sisters in their lives? How do we get the best outcome for the truth and for their development as we walk hand in hand to the kingdom? Do you know, sometimes too much passion and too much zeal in the things of our lives can blind us to the fact that we're working with people that God is working with too. And we've got to walk together to get to the kingdom to help each other. You know, we have to be outcome focused and think about whether others might be more beneficial or have a better way in which they could deal with the situation. Saul had to learn this on this occasion. And so, in verse 30, back in Acts chapter 9, when the Grecians went about to slay him, it was the brethren that brought him down to Caesarea. Under the instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ, they then bring him to Caesarea and send him forth to Tarsus. And so Christ, and so Saul, with Christ's message ringing in his head, left Jerusalem, urged on by the brethren who brought him to Caesarea and then boarded by ship, sent him home to Tarsus. You know, there's a question, isn't there? What, What on earth was Saul doing going home? Why did, when, and why back in Tarsus, and what, what did Saul do back in Tarsus? Why go home? Well, come and have a look in Galatians chapter 1, verse 21 23. Christ had to remove him completely from Jerusalem because, well, Christ had a very special work that he was going to do. But there was going to be two things happening at once here because Christ was going to not only prepare Saul for his next work, but he was going to prepare the land and the environment for the next mission and to receive the Apostle Paul. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 21 and 23. So yes, Galatians chapter 1, verse 21. So he says, Paul says this, Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. It was unknown by face unto the ecclesias of Judea which were in Christ. But, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past, now preached the faith which he had once destroyed. And they glorified God in me. And so it would appear that that Saul travelled home just just like those that he had once persecuted. And he went about to preach the truth to all who wanted to hear. But back in Jerusalem... Back in in, um, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, don't bother turning there, I'll tell you. It says this, in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, it says, Then had the ecclesias rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. 
You see, it wasn't until Saul was ultimately removed that they actually received a reprieve from the unrest of the persecution of Saul, the unrest from the Jewish Sanhedrin, the uprising of the Grecians in Jerusalem, so that the word of God might multiply in the land. And so now back in Tarsus, Saul waited. When we piece together the story of Galatians chapter 1, Saul waits for approximately three to four years, studying, praying, and working with those of his hometown as he consolidated all he knew and thought about his new role and his mission. So I've got a question. Why did Christ wait for four years after Saul returned home? From his conversion, he was three years in Damascus, probably some time in Arabia, let's just argue maybe three to four years. He was in two weeks in Jerusalem before, flicked on a boat and sent back to, to Tarsus. And then left in Tarsus for four years. Why? What on earth was Christ doing? This was a man that was passionate to go to the Gentiles. Surely Christ could have hit the go button on it now. But no. Why did he wait? Well, I think there's two key reasons for that. I think the first key reason is, well, Saul needed to take some time. Saul was very passionate about what he was trying to do, but that passion could become blinded if, not, if he wasn't careful. And so Christ wanted Saul to take some time in his hometown to think deeply and to contemplate all the scriptures and develop a fuller appreciation of all the types and patterns contained in the Psalms and the Prophets. You know, Saul's rabbinical training all of a sudden became extremely useful as he could read and study in, the, in the, the almost peacefulness of his own hometown as he went about to preach the truth without the conflicts that he would later experience. But I actually think there's a far more important reason for why Saul, Paul waited for four years. Some, some have said, you know, Paul just lost the truth. He just lost the plot. He, just, he disappeared off the radar. I don't believe that's the case at all. Certainly not the import of Acts. Do you know, the import of Acts as to why there's a four-year wait was because Christ had to prepare a whole bunch of people to accept him when he came. You see, what we're going to see now for the next five minutes is, is that we're going to see that Christ was preparing the Jewish population to accept the fact that the truth was about to be extended to the Gentiles. This was going to be a massive transformational shift in their thinking and required a lot of preparation so that they might fully understand and, and comprehend that. You see, Christ was going to have to work with Peter in Joppa. He was going to have to work with Cornelius in Caesarea. He was going to have to work with the Jews of the circumcision party in Jerusalem. And ultimately he was going to have to get them to accept the ecclesia that was developing and emerging and exploding with the Gentile converts in Antioch. You see, Christ was having to prepare them for the truth to go to the Gentiles. And so Peter, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 I was going to have to learn, that we don't have time to cover any of these stories obviously, but what was Peter going to have to learn in Acts chapter 10 verse 34? Well, he was going to have to learn of a truth, he says as he opens his mouth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, Acts 10 verse 34, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And the word which God speaks is sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of, colour in the word, all. That was a lesson Peter had to learn. And Peter watched the vision come down with animals, four-footed beasts and creeping things, go up and down three times. He's like, oh, what's that all about? Cornelius turns up at his doorstep. He has light bulbs for breakfast. And all of a sudden he understands, ah, oh, the truth's got to go to the Gentiles. I accept that. And immediately... The Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and his family. And so while Peter's yet speaking, verse 44, the Holy Spirit falls, and they of the circumcision party are going to learn. Those that which believed and were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And of course, this was not Peter's work. This was the Lord providing the support to Peter's statement. They go, whoa, Peter says, can anyone forbid water for these people? Seeing the Holy Spirit's fallen on them? Of course not. God's expanded his truth to the Gentiles. And so they're dipped in water and they pray with them and they tarry these certain days. And then they all come back to Jerusalem and the circumcision party in Acts chapter 11 decide to get stuck into them. Verse, verse 2, when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they which were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you in him to eat with uncircumcised men. You know, what were you doing? So Peter has to repeat the entire story. And so finally in verse 18, when they heard these things, verse 18, they held their peace and they glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And meanwhile, Christ is working with, with the ecclesia in Jerusalem so that now they of, and Jerusalem now appreciate it, they of Joppa, so Peter's, Peter's environment now knows, and Caesarea is all alive with the work of Cornelius, so the Gentiles are slowly starting to understand in Judea what's going on. Whilst that's happening, Christ is working in Antioch in verse 19. Now, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word, but, but they were only preaching to the Jews. But some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, and when they were come to Antioch, they spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, and the hand of the Lord was on them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So whilst Christ is working in Judea with Peter and, and the apostles and the circumcision party, the truth goes boom to the Gentiles in Antioch. You see Christ at work here, doing all, this, doing all this stuff to prepare and to do the groundwork for when he was going to call Saul. And so all of a sudden, the, the tiding comes back unto the ears of the ecclesia in verse 22, which is Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas. Whoa, that's funny, isn't it? The man who had looked after Saul in the first place. Said, oh, let's choose Barnabas. How fortunate that was guided by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Barnabas was going to go as far as Antioch. And so when he comes in verse 23, having seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. And he's there and he just sees the truth exploding and he goes, I can't do this on my own. He goes, I know the man for the job. Verse 25. He goes to find Saul. And when he'd found him, he brings him back to Jerusalem, uh, to, to, to Antioch. And so, and so they, and so Saul is now, Saul's now brought by Barnabas. So Barnabas is fizzing. And so he finds Saul and, it's, and, and now, now it's about the time and he convinces Saul, the truth has gone to the Gentiles. It's time to get together and unleash the wonder of God's purpose to the entire world. And so Barnabas is fizzing, he finds Saul, he brings him back to Antioch and they both settle in Antioch, for we know, for a period of 12 months. Well, it's there in verse 26. They were there, it comes to pass, he says, for a whole year when they assembled themselves with the ecclesia and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so for 12 months, Barnabas and Saul worked with the believers to develop the, this largely Gentile ecclesia and preaching and exhorting them. But I want you to notice, it's Barnabas' lead. This is Barnabas' this is Barnabas's lead all through this occasion. The two of them was gonna, were going to work together to cement the new ecclesia, but it was Barnabas' lead. You know, there was going to be a come a dearth in the time of Jerusalem. We don't have time to look at it, but, it's, but notice what it says, verse 30. And so they decided to, to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. And when they did, they sent, it by the, um, they sent it to the elders, which is obviously Peter, James, and John, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. It's Barnabas in the lead. It's Saul in the follower. He says, so they sent a collection from the Gentile ecclesias to Jerusalem, which were poor. Mainly because of Saul's persecutions. And the dearth that they were now experiencing. The famine. And so they sent it by the hands of Saul and, and Barnabas. No, if you want to scratch in your margin, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Galatians 2, 1 to 10. It's this time. 
that they received the right hand of fellowship from Peter, James and John, who were the pillars of Jerusalem Ecclesia, that, that they, Barnabas and Saul, would preach to the Gentiles and that Peter, James and John, they would stay with the Jews. Galatians 2, verses 1 to 10. This is the right hand of fellowship moment when they bring the collection of the Gentiles to the Jerusalem Jews. And so now in Acts chapter 13, the, the, Jerusalem, uh, sorry, the Antioch Ecclesia grows and they diligently minister with the believers there. Notice the list in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Now there were in the Ecclesia at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, the lead, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius, Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and last of all, Saul. Saul's the last. He's there amongst the elders and the prophets and the teachers of the Antioch Ecclesia, but he's not the lead. And as they ministered, says verse 2, unto the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit says, it's time. The time is now right. They ministered until the day finally arrived and Christ appears and calls Barnabas and Saul to their ultimate work to preach the truth to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so he says, separate me Barnabas. This was going to be a permanent change. This wasn't just a temporary visitation of Saul and Barnabas to go on a journey and then come back to Antioch to settle again. No, this was going to be a permanent change. You see, what's interesting is, is that they were never ever, and Acts goes into a lot of pains to talk about this, they never ever lived anywhere again permanently. Galatians, uh, sorry, Acts 4 verse 28 says, when they came back, they abode there for a long time. It's, a, it's an Antioch, Acts, uh, Acts 14 verse 28. Acts 15 verse 35, it says, then they continued in Antioch. Antioch was going to become their base, but it was never going to be their home. And from this point on, they're sent away. They're separated to the work. You know, it's interesting. They are never referred, or sorry, they are only ever referred from this point forth to be called apostles. It's the apostles, the apostles, the apostles. Why? Because now they are sent as their ministry as unfolds. The sent, the apostles, the sent ones. Acts chapter 14, verse 4, it's they're called the apostles. Acts chapter 4 and verse 14, they are referred to as the apostles. They're never referred to anything other than that. Because now the Holy Spirit had permanently set up them apart for their role and ministry to teach the truth to the Gentiles. The time was ripe for Christ. To unleash the sleeper cell of Saul of Tarsus to the Gentiles. And so they're sent away. When they when they'd fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Verse 3. And so they being sent forth by the Holy Spirit, departed unto Seleucia on the coast. And from Seleucia they sailed to Salamis in Cyprus. They come to Barnabas' hometown. They thought it was a nice place to start. And so they, they walk into the synagogue of, in, of the Jews in Acts chapter 13 and verse 5. You see, because now Christ is going to teach a lesson. So you ought to preach to the Gentiles. And so they walk into the synagogue of the Jews and they had John Mark as their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they didn't get any people talking about the truth. They just didn't get anyone listening. So they walked into it. They realized their work was not only with the Jews. And so they continued across the Isle of Cyprus under Paphos. They went from one side of the island to the other. And it wasn't going to be long before they encountered opposition. But it was not going to be from where they expected it. You see, Christ had to teach Saul a final lesson. 
You see, the lesson that Christ was going to teach Saul, brothers and sisters and young people, was that he had to personalize the truth for himself. You see, in the past, opposition had come from their own nationality in the guise of Saul's own buddies of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who would withstand them in their teachings of the law, but this is not going to be the case on this occasion. They were going to come face to face with elements, the sorcerer. And brothers and sisters and young people, Saul was going to come face to face with some opposition that was much more evil, much more sinister. And he was going to find something that absolutely shocked them to the core. And he's going to find something that was way far too familiar in Elamis. I'll show you what that is in a second. So, he comes across the island of Paphos, and he finds, isn't that amazing? He found a man. Christ had strategically put Elamis here. He finds a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. You know, when you read the scriptures, brothers and sisters, it's very easy just to read that, isn't it? He came across and he found a sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Do you know, we're given a lot of detail about this man. You ever stop to think about why we're given some detail about him? You see, sometimes we've got to ask these questions. He's a certain sorcerer. He's a magus. A magi. A wise man. A man who was versed in oriental astrology. He's called a false prophet. A man who claimed to have divine inspiration but was completely and utterly misguided. He was going to be a Jew, however, of the seed of Israel, whose name was going to be Bar-Jesus, son of Yah, which will save. You see here, brothers and sisters and young people, was a descendant of Abraham, who claimed to be divinely inspired, who was wise in his own conceit and followed ancient customs and the stars. This is a man who was steeped in astrology and was mixing truth and error. And look who he's with, verse 7. He was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. He's a man who was wise. He wanted to know what was going on. He found out about these two interesting Jewish prophets. And so he called them to hear the word of God. He's with the deputy of the country. You know, that's the, he's the proconsul. You know, when, when Caesar, Caesar was, was setting up his, his domains, he would set up particular areas, and over each area he would set up a council. So this man, this man whose name is Sergius Paulus, reported to Caesar in Rome. You wouldn't get too much higher up the food chain if you tried. And here he was, with a man like Alamus, right next door to him, giving him the guidance and the wisdom as to what should occur in his life. Remember, the Romans were incredibly superstitious. If you haven't read Asterix, I suggest you do. Particularly the soothsayer. But he was with the proconsul, the ruler of the country. A man who was on delegated authority from Caesar himself. And he's with the province, he's, he's the ruler of the province of Cyprus. And he, and he wants to hear the word of God. Can you imagine Alamus? Alamus is working alongside him. Just picture the scene. He's just working as Sergius Paulus' personal advisor. Pretty important role. Good coin. You see, Alamus had received a very special office in the courts of the proconsul. And as the news had traveled about two new teachers and their doctrine, well, Sergius Paulus summoned for them to hear them, possibly looking for advice as to what they would say. And all at once, Elymas is in a really awkward predicament. He's in a totally horrible position. He's going to be found out for who he was, an imposter and a fraud. And his only hope to save his reputation was to discredit and undermine the teachings of Saul and Barnabas. And he was going to take them on in an open debate. Fault number one. You don't take on Saul of Tarsus in a debate. And so, in verse 8, 
Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is by interpretation, withstood them. Do you know what it means? To set oneself against, to directly resist and oppose. That's what it means. To set oneself against and to directly resist and oppose. And what was he doing? He was trying to, he was seeking to turn or to turn the deputy from the faith. You know, the word turn, color that word in, because it's exactly the same word pervert in verse 10. How long wilt thou pervert the right ways of God? Means to twist the words of the apostles, to undermine. He was seeking to twist and to turn the arguments so that, well, Saul and Barnabas might be discredited. He was trying to twist the words of the apostle Paul to undermine them through debating. And so obviously the proconsul had begun to listen. Sergius Paulus was very intent on understanding what's going on. And all of a sudden, Elymas is on the back foot. And he begins to twist and spin the words to misconstrue this truth. And that got Saul's goat. You don't do that with the truth for Saul from this point forward. And drilling in between the eyeballs, Saul te- um, tells Elymas exactly what he thought of him. Look at what Saul does. Verse, verse 9. Then Saul who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and drills him. And look what he says. This is awesome. Verse 10. O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Do you know what he does? As he takes all the titles of Elymas and spits them back in his face. You're full of all subtlety. You're a sorcerer. You're guile and craft and astrology and deceit. That's what you are. You're a sorcerer. Good on you. You're full of all mischief. Means to be unscrupulous and cunning and lewd in your behavior. You reckon you're a prophet. You're a false prophet. Aren't you? You're a child of the Diabolos. You're not a son of Jesus whatsoever. You're a child of the Diabolos. You're the son of the false accuser. And you're the enemy of all righteousness. You know, he says you're the opponent of the law of God. You think you're a Jew? You don't know the law backwards. You don't know even standing on your head. You've got no idea about the law. You're the enemy of all that which is righteous. And the question he throws at him is a rhetorical one in verse 10. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? How long are you going to try and twist the righteousness which is found in the Lord Jesus Christ? How long? Therefore he says, verse 11, The hand of the Lord is upon thee, thou shalt be blind not seeing the sun for a season. When Saul invokes the intervention of the Lord to affect the sight of Elymas, to demonstrate the practical blindness that Elymas had, and not being able to rightly divide the word of truth. And immediately Elymas is blinded. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? The proconsul had come to hear the word of God, and now he sees it at work before him. You've got to ask yourself a question, because I do. You know, Saul's come across opposition like this so many times. Saul's encountered all the Sanhedrin, he's encountered the Jews, he's encountered the Gerichians. But this time, this occasion, made Saul pop an eye socket on Elymas. And lash out so harshly on this critic. Why? Why did he burst a blood vessel here? You know, I believe, brothers and sisters, Elymas was put there for a very specific reason by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here Christ was going to teach the final lesson to Saul that he had never properly seen before. You see, because on this occasion, brothers and sisters, I think Saul saw in Elymas something he had never seen in his own life. You see, because what Saul saw in Elymas before him was the mirrored reflection of the old Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee. You see, you think about this, brothers and sisters, 
Saul wanders, to this, wanders through the aisle and comes face to face with a man that was the old ghost of Saul of Tarsus. Have a think about this. He was a man who'd parted with the ruler of the country, the proconsul. And here was Saul of Tarsus who had received the authority of the Sanhedrin. He was a wise man who was an expert in his field on astrology, as Saul was in the field of the law. He was a man that, oh, it was totally misguided and had it all wrong, and knew it. He was a Jew that argued that the law could save, and was twisting all the truth. And a man who had stood to resist the truth, and not only that, but to turn as many as he could away. From the right ways of the Lord. And a man who was deliberately perverting the true teaching of the gospel. Do you know what brothers and sisters, Alamus, for Saul, was the perfect replica of the self-conceited, totally misguided, unbelievably patched protection, passionate yet deluded Saul of Tarsus. And just look, just look at how he punishes him. Oh, that's brilliant, isn't it? Saul saw it, knew it, because he says in verse 11, And now the hand of the Lord is going to be upon thee, and you're going to, you're going to be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And you know what Alamus does? As his eyelids close, as he goes blind, it says that he reached out and sought someone to lead him by the hand. Acts Chapter 9, verse 8. The very punishment that Saul himself had received after staring into the eyes and the burning eyes of Jesus of Nazareth was now received by Elimus under the burning eyes of Christ to the Gentiles. And Saul, for the first time in his life, brothers and sisters, came to fully appreciate and understand just how damaging his teaching and deception had been without the persecutions. You see, Paul didn't realize, I don't believe fully, brothers and sisters, that it wasn't the persecutions that had done the damage. It was the arguing style and the debates and the deception and the twisting of the word and the resisting of the truth that had caused much more damage. He'd been so passionate in his persuasion, he'd been incredibly successful in perverting the right ways of the truth. And so now he set about to reverse this damage. So, brothers and sisters, I believe that that's why we're told that at this point that Saul's name has changed. You see, because now he understood the true teaching and the true ministry that he had. This was a turning point in Saul's life. It's from here that the scripture points that he's changed from Saul, the Hebrew, who was desired, to Paul, the Greek, who was little. You see, Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. And so he removes his Hebrew title of the desired one, and takes the Greek title, the little one, as it catapults him to his ministry to the Gentiles. This was the turning point in Saul's life, the revelation of the true damage he had caused, and the validation and the realizing of what his calling was all about. You see, now he realized was the time to change and reverse the effects of his deceptive teaching. And it's from this point, brothers and sisters and young people, that Paul the Apostle shot off like a rocket and Barnabas couldn't keep up. It was from this point that Paul took the leadership. Paul and his company now takes off. Something in Paul changed, brothers and sisters. Everything fell into place now. And off he went. Do you know what's the lesson, brothers and sisters? Well, the lesson is this. Christ had taken Saul of Tarsus on an incredibly transformational journey, which had taken over seven years in the making. You see, this was not a Damascus experience that converted the Apostle Paul 
No, it wasn't. It was the start of a progressive journey in taking the man of Saul of Tarsus to become Paul the Apostle. And it took over seven years to get there. There's a lesson in that for us, isn't there? You see, whilst the Damascus experience called Saul to the gospel, it was, and the Arabian experience committed Saul to the truth, it was ultimately the Cyprus encounter that catapulted Paul into preaching. And then, and only then, did Paul really lead with the urgency and zeal and faith in response to his calling. Because he now fully understood his ministry. You see, it took over seven years for the calling of Christ to actually translate into action. God providentially placed Alamus in front of Saul's face as the final catalyst to catapult him into action to be Christ's ambassador to the Gentiles. You see, the lesson is obvious, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And this is really the key of the lesson of the story of the conversion of Saul. You see, whilst we come to a knowledge of the truth through baptism, we encounter on our way Damascus experiences. Sometimes they're transformational, and sometimes they're not. But the Damascus experience is, is when we realize that we are misguided, when we have got it not quite right. The flash of realization causes us to sit up and to take note and to respond to the truth. We've all been called to the truth, that's why we're here. We've all had a Damascus experience. You know, some of us might experience, might need to experience wake up calls like Saul did on the road to Damascus, but many of us won't. And if we're waiting for the alarm, it might never go off. God's called us already. We've already been shown the truth. That's why we're here. We've already been in the Damascus experience. And it's what follows from here that's the most important. You see, once we've responded to the call, we might initially be enthusiastic. But it won't take long before that enthusiasm fades. The novelty wears off. The euphoria disappears after we go through the waters of baptism. And the point is this, brothers and sisters, is that we need to spend time in Arabia to maintain the fervency and passion of truth. To hear and understand and appreciate the still small voice of God's word. To begin to develop in our hearts and in our minds. But the most important step is what comes next, brothers and sisters, because even then we're not converted, are we? Because the most important step is that it's actually got to touch our hearts, to reach our hands, our lips and our mouths, to let God work in us for others. That's when we truly know that we are converted in our life, brothers and sisters. It's easy to slip into our old routines and not personalize the truth. We've got to grab the truth with both hands. We've got to let the Damascus experience drive us to Arabia. And let Arabia convince us the truth is the truth. That it converts us to tell and teach all we come in contact with about the wonders of the truth. The marvelous gospel of grace. And the saving name we have in being, in being able to call upon our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the process of conversion took Saul many years. Many experiences. Even after two direct revelations of Jesus Christ. After the personal help of Ananias and Barnabas and Peter and James. But even took a final step of Elymas to convince him that he needed to change his life. His outlook and his name. And that caused them to respond to his missionary calling as a witness to the Gentiles. You know, from this point forth, brothers and sisters and young people, saw Paul took off. From this point, he never looked back. Over the next 18 years, he undertook five missionary journeys, wrote at least 14 epistles to over eight different ecclesias, to three individuals traveling through the entire known world, experiencing many things that he doesn't care to even name for the Lord of Jesus Christ's sake. Committed and conditioned to suffer great things for his sake. May we truly understand the lesson of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. 
so that we might learn in our final study how to take that, harness that, and to suffer for Christ's sake.